Federal Standards and Legal Terms. It's really necessary to have an understanding of everything about IV therapy prior to learning how to perform IV therapy. Today, millions of patients are receiving highly specialized IV therapy, such as chemotherapy or hyperalimentation, and some of this is even in their own homes. And this can be accomplished because we have established guidelines and we use specialized nursing personnel. As medical achievements continue, the healthcare industry will keep pace, and so should we as nurses to provide the best quality available to our patients. The infusion nursing standards of practice shall be applied and met in all practice settings where infusion therapy is administered. And this includes our professional standards of practice. Infusion therapy shall be established in facility policies and procedures and in accordance with the State Board of Nursing and accrediting agencies. And this is overseen by the KSBN regulatory agency. And facility infusion policies and procedures shall be written and renewed and be compliant with state and federal laws and professional standards. Now facility policy and procedures can be more restrictive than federal or um, state laws, but they cannot be less. In any nursing duty that we perform, we have to be accountable for our actions. This is known as the triangle of legal responsibility, knowledge, competent skills and continued education, and sound nursing judgment. Ethical principles shall be the foundations for decision making and patient advocacy. Principles of beneficence, non-maleficence, fidelity, protection of patient autonomy, justice, and veracity shall dictate nursing actions. All licensed nursing personnel with responsibility for infusion therapy shall possess a license and good standing with that their state's board of nursing. LPNs cannot discontinue central lines or pick lines. The LPN can insert IV access devices that do not exceed 3 inches in length, are located in peripheral sites only. They can also maintain patency of central and peripheral IV access devices and administration sets with medications or solutions as allowed by policy of the specific facility and they can administer IV push analgesics, antibiotic, antibiotics, antiemetics, diuretics, and corticosteroids as per facility policy if they have completed the certification program of IV therapy. And this lists what IVs shall not perform. This regulation limits the scope of practice, but does not restrict a licensed practical nurse's authority to care for patients that receive this type of therapy. Malpractice is defined as the negligent conduct of professional persons that results in injury. Negligence is the failure of a professional person to act in a reasonable and prudent manner with resultant damage to a person or that person's property. Rule of personal liability is basically every person is liable for his or her own tortuous conduct. In other words, his or her own wrongdoing. A tort is a private wrong either by act or omission of act that can result in a civil action by the harmed person or that person's legal heirs. Assault is an intentional act that is designed to make another fearful or apprehensive of immediate bodily harm 
or the threat of touching. Battery is any intentional touching of another person either without consent or with consent that has been exceeded or fraudulently obtained. So these are some things that you should never do or always do. And this lists some principles for you to avoid uh, malpractice litigation. Make sure that when you are obtaining orders for IV therapy that you obtain the fluid type, the fluid volume, and specific infusion rate, along with how often any specific medications that need to be added to the fluid and any special considerations. And you should always adhere to the read back process, which means that you are repeating the order to the prescriber to verify accuracy. Goals of infusion therapy and the patient or caregiver role are related to the performance of specific aspects of infusion care, and these should be mutually developed with the patient and or caregiver. Remember that reimbursement to your facility is often based on accurate documentation, so you must document appropriately. Informed consent is not required for routine IVs because that's kind of covered in their uh, agreement to be admitted to a facility or to be treated by a facility when they sign that paper. But it is required for central line placement, for PIC line placement, and for the infusion of some drugs or chemicals that can cause harm, such as chemotherapy and for the infusion of blood products. The nurse has to confirm that the patient's informed consent was obtained and documented and understood. The nurse has to advocate for the patient's or the legal representative's right to accept or refuse treatment. So documentation is a written or printed recording of the original, official, or legal information that becomes part of the patient's medical record regarding the patient's infusion therapy and vascular access. So it has a threefold purpose. First of all, it will record pertinent information regarding the status of the patient. So this enhances the continuity and appropriateness of the medical nursing care provided. Second, it's to create a legal record of the care that's provided. So comprehensiveness and accuracy of the documentation is imperative. And lastly, it's to help obtain reimbursement for various aspects of care that has been provided. Documentation should also include joint stabilization devices or site protection devices. You must assess a site at least every eight hours, but it is more frequent for pediatric patients and for drugs that are caustic to the t uh, tissues in the event of extravasation, such as the dopamine that I mentioned previously. And you also have to document the patency. You need to document the type of therapy what is the drug, the dosage, the rate, the time, the route, and the method of administration. If there is a multiple access device such as a triple lumen catheter, you need to clearly state what is being infused where. So you have the distal, the medial, and the proximal ports, and these are where the ports are on the catheter within the venous system. So if it's closest to the end, if it's further away from the end, etc. But you need to document which solution is being infused in which port. The patient's vital signs, any education that you have provided, 
when you remove the device, you need to document the condition of the site, the condition of the catheter, you know, was it intact? Why did you remove it? Any specific interventions that were used during removal, if it's outside of the normal, that the dressing was applied, the patient's response, any education provided, and the date and the time of removal. Some of the more common forms that are used in documentation of IV therapy include nurse's notes, the IV flow sheet, the medication administration record, and make sure that you always do your med verify, the blood transfusion administration record, and INO records. Errors in documentation include using subjective instead of objective statements. For example, the IV is infusing well instead of IV infusing at a rate of 100 cc's or mLs per hour. Giving a medical diagnosis instead of describing the appearance of the site. For example, IV site DC due to phlebitis instead of IV site DC due to redness and edema. And make sure that you avoid abbreviations in your documentation, if at all possible. And if you do use abbreviations, make sure that they are your facility approved abbreviations. And never, ever, ever forget your patient's medication rights. If you follow the patient's medication rights, you will almost be guaranteed of never performing, and notice I said almost, of never performing a medication error. The variance report or incident report, of whatever it's called in your facility, is meant to improve patient safety, and it's not meant to focus on the error that was performed by the nurse. They're used as an internal tracking mechanism for quality assurance by identifying patterns of errors or potentially dangerous situations, as well as the facility's insurance carrier. They must be objectively prepared. In other words, you've got to keep emotion out of incident reports and documentation. And there should be no reference to this report being completed in the patient's medical record. This is a red flag to the legal field.